You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 136. This week, a big thank you goes out to David for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where he now gets access to special Patreon-only episodes. You can find out more information at patreon.com slash history of the Great War. This episode sees us once again going back in time to 1916, and while we are there, we are going to talk about the air war over the Western Front. The last time we talked about the war in the air was way back in our 1915 episodes, which was still before the aircraft pilots and aerial tactics really came to maturity. Over the next three episodes, which I promise to be very long, we will be discussing the era of greatest innovation during the war, 1916 and 1917. These two years would see the German, French, and British air forces take on a much larger role on the battlefield and begin a trend that would carry them to the end of the war. 1917 in particular would be an important year for the air war, because it was in some ways the climax, because it would see the point where three different trends would reach their peak. First was the technological advancements. 1917 would see all of the air forces finally utilizing technologies like the synchronizing gear, have more powerful engines, and far more maneuverable aircraft. The second was tactical advancements, with moves away from single pilots or small groups wandering around the sky, and instead a focus on large groups of organized hunters. The third trend was the rise of many of the most famous pilots who would reach their peak during 1917. Some of the early pioneers would not make it to 1917, but in the last 18 months of the war, the number of planes and engagements over the front would so drastically increase that the number of aces and the scores of those highest killers would dwarf everybody who came before. All of that is, of course, in 1917. But before we get there, we have to talk about 1916, where all these changes had their roots. Today we're going to break up our discussion into three parts. We're going to discuss the German, and then the French, and then the British Air Forces. Our discussion of the Brits will be a bit light during this episode, because the next one, episode 137, will be solely focused on the Battle of the Somme, which will of course provide the British with plenty of spotlight. The Germans started 1916 with probably the best fighter currently active in any air force, the Fokker monoplane. This great airframe allowed them to maintain some form of aerial supremacy over the front, with many British and French reconnaissance flights falling prey to the Fokker. However, in this time of lightning-fast innovation, no airplane would stay at the top for long, and by spring 1916, the Fokker was beginning to show some signs of age, and found itself outpaced by some new French and British planes that were arriving at the front. The first attempt to rectify this was to take the Fokker monoplane and turn it into a biplane, a reasonably easy change, but there was a problem. The resulting airframe was too stable. This is actually a problem that would be encountered by several airplanes during the war, and the concept of it may seem a bit counterintuitive. When most people today are around planes, you're usually talking about large passenger planes, which you want to be very stable for comfort and reliability. However, military aircraft are very different. The key with a fighter plane, especially these early types, is that you want to find a balance between stability and instability, because it is the instability that allows the plane to have the level of maneuverability required for dogfighting, 
If a plane is too stable, then it can be very difficult to get it to do anything other than a dive or a shallow turn. And of course, in the dangerous skies of 1916, the pilots would need to be doing all kinds of quick turns and spins and dives to keep from getting killed. This instability can of course be taken too far, and if it is, then the plane will probably just crash, or be too unsafe to fly. So the key was to find the right mixture, which is something that was not always easy. Even with the stability issues with the Fokker biplane, it did not prevent the Germans from continuing to innovate, and in the summer of 1916, that led to the next great German fighter, the Albatross. The Albatross D-1 and D-2 would begin arriving at the front in late summer 1916, and they were powered by a 160 horsepower engine, and they were sporting two machine guns. Now, not only did they have all of the firepower of the two machine guns, but they were also both synchronized to fire through their propellers, giving them a decided advantage over the Entente planes that they would meet over the front. But there was also another and far less obvious innovation in the Albatross, and that was its plywood construction. Up until this point, most of the planes in the war were made out of normal hardwood, which had properties of normal wood, like bending and warping. However, plywood could be created and molded in such a way that it would provide far more strength while also being lighter, which was a huge advantage. The Germans apparently did not invent the use of plywood in planes, and instead borrowed it from the Russians, who had been using it earlier in the war. The Albatrosses would be the primary workhorses for the Germans in late 1916 and 1917, but there were other planes as well. Two of these, the Fokker E3 and E4, were the favorites of Germany's most gifted pilots, uh, people that we will discuss in just a bit. Both of these models also had the twin synchronized machine guns and a 160 horsepower engine. But they also had the unfortunate issue, especially in the E3, of occasionally getting their machine guns out of sync and shooting off their own propellers, which was something of a problem, but one that was mostly fixed by the time the E4 came out. The E4 was something of a prototype in 1916, and was generally only given to the absolute best pilots, while most other pilots would still be flying the Albatross when the year ended. A critical piece of German air strategy before the war had nothing to do with fighters, though, and instead focused on airships. Now, we discussed airships in some of our previous episodes, especially their most famous bombing raids on London and other areas of Britain during the war. And while they were useful as a terror weapon in this capacity, there were also several attempts to use them closer to the front. At Verdun, it was hoped that they could be used in a nighttime bombing raid on French lines. However, the first few times that this was tried, the raids were unsuccessful, and further raids would be cancelled. This lackluster performance resulted in the airships being pulled from Western Front service. Overall, the Zeppelins were a huge failure for the Germans, because they were never able to find a way to use them that made up for all of the time and resources spent on maintaining and outfitting their Zeppelin fleet. When Hindenburg and Ludendorff took over command in late 1916, the Zeppelins would be reduced in priority to the point that their primary role for the rest of the war would be as scouts for the high seas fleet. To keep planes coming to the front, there were of course problems to be solved on the home front. The first of these problems was how the German aviation industry was organized, on both a political and military level, a problem that they would have to solve if they wanted to best utilize the resources available to them. Many of the problems in the aviation industry could be traced back to the fact that when the war started, nobody had a large air force, and when the requirements at the front skyrocketed, an entirely new set of command and control institutions had to be created and organized before they could rationalize industrial output. The Germans had the additional problem of the fact that both the Navy and the Bavarian Army had their own air forces, which they were very adamant that they wanted to keep separate. The strain of Verdun and the Somme caused these desires to change, and a new command of General of the Air Force was created, and this was given to General Ernst von Hoppner. He would be in control of the entirety of Germany's air assets, and would also oversee their growth and development. That growth was influenced by a memo written by Field Aviation Chief Leith Thompson, entitled The Expansion of the Flying Troops in Winter 1916-1917. In this memo, Leith Thompson made the case that the Germans would have to find a way to be far more efficient in both their manufacturing and usage of planes at the front if they had any hope of combating the obvious material superiority of the Entente. 
This was an astute observation, if maybe a bit obvious, but Leith Thompson's push for efficiency would help drive the German air forces to try and make sure that they were not wasting any planes that made it to the front. But they also had to make more planes, and that's where they ran into their second problem. When it came to increasing the production of German aircraft, the German government would spend the first three years of the war trying to wrangle and control the German aviation industry. One interesting piece of that puzzle that John H. Morrow discusses in his book The Great War in the Air is the role of patents in German aircraft production. Remember, all of these countries that were making planes were private organizations and they were in the industry to make money. In 1914, eight of these manufacturers agreed to let the military use some of their lesser patents for free, but many major patents, and some very important ones, did not fall under this agreement. This would then lead to many more discussions over the coming years. In 1916, there would be six months of discussions in the Reichstag that eventually led to an agreement between the manufacturers and the government. The agreement was that any patent claims against the military would be waived, as long as the following three conditions were met. The first condition was that if the military wanted to build a part, say, at a workshop behind the front, which was under patent protection, they would have to negotiate a special agreement with the patent holder. The second condition was that if another company wanted to make the part as part of a military contract, they could do so, but they would have to pay a fabrication fee. Finally, the 1914 agreement would continue to stand as negotiated at the time. While this got the ball rolling again, the war ministry was already trying to find a way around the whole situation by using their influence to just make sure that no new patents got issued for aircraft parts. This was particularly important due to the pace of technological advancement in the aviation industry, where a plane built in 1915 may share almost nothing with a plane in 1917. While the patent issue was mostly solved, it was just one of many issues that was being dealt with. There were also contracts, the constant struggle to get companies to work together as much as possible, and any number of administrative issues when it came to getting the manufacturers the raw materials that they needed. Even with all of these issues, the Germans were progressing towards their goal of 1,000 planes built per month in 1916. While this was sufficient in 1916 standards, they would have to find a way to be once again more efficient in 1917. Before we move on to other countries, we should briefly talk about German air tactics during 1916. The Germans from 1916 onwards would always be fighting against more planes than they themselves could produce. This forced them to try and use their planes as efficiently as possible. The biggest of these changes, and probably the one that they are most known for, was the creation of the Jagdstaffel, or hunting groups. The creation of these groups and the concentration of the planes within them went against previous tactics, where one plane or small groups would go out on patrol alone. With the creation of these groups, it did not solve all of Germany's issues, but at the very least allowed them to fight back efficiently on the areas of the front that the groups were present. This reorganization was only possible because of the reorganization in the German command structure. Up until 1916, the flight units had been under the command of various army corps along the front. However, as air combat became a larger and larger priority, these units were moved up the chain of command, eventually finding their way to army headquarters. At these headquarters, they were given a commanding general, who would be in communication with air group officers at each corps headquarters. They would then work to use the available air units as efficiently as possible along the entire army's front instead of just on the corps level. This increased structure allowed the Germans to utilize the planes that they had better and also move them around on larger areas of the front. In many ways, the centralization of command of the Air Force went along with a similar movement happening in the artillery, as the artillery moved up to higher levels of command as they needed to get bigger and bigger groups of them together. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, 
And if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com GW50 to get 50% off. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. A conversation of the German Air Forces in 1916 would not be complete without a discussion of their duo of famous aces from that year. When the year started, the two most famous pilots in the German Air Force were Max Immelmann and Oswald Boltke. On January 12th, Boltke was credited with his eighth victory, a number that Immelmann would match the very next day. These feats would then earn them the Pol Mert, which was the highest military honor in Germany. Many of you may know that on the scale of World War I aces, eight victories is not a whole lot. But this was a very different time. Many aces would rack up a ton of kills later in the war, but when there were simply more aircraft in the sky to shoot down. But at the beginning of 1916, eight victories was a lot. Of course, the two pilots were not done when they got their eighth victory, and during 1916 their numbers would continue to rise for a while. Immelman would be the first casualty on June 18th when his Fokker E3 was shot down and crashed. He would be credited with 16 kills before he died, and his death would have far-reaching effects. Many German pilots saw him as invincible, and his death caused morale to sink. The exact opposite happened on the British side, where their morale soared for the very same reason. Back at German High Command, they saw what the death of Immelman had done to their pilots, and they decided that they could not let the same happen to Boltke. He was therefore taken out of active service and sent on a tour of the home front. It would be during this time that he would create the training and tactical guidelines that would be the foundation of German air tactics for the rest of the war. Boltke was very unhappy during this time away from the front, and he would constantly push to go back, a battle that he would finally win in August. Late in that month, he was sent back to the front and put in command of his own Jagdstaffel. During his time leading the group, he would meticulously train the other pilots with his new theories and practices, mostly around how they could work together. They would be the scourge of the air, until on October 28th, when Bolka would collide with another aircraft while in pursuit of a German plane. His plane went to the ground, and he would be killed instantly. Both of these pilots and their deaths would be the end of an era for German air forces. They had been the greatest stars of 1915 and 1916 and would be the last of the great German aces that flew most of their career in the early days of the war. But in their time, they had started the German forces on their way to the future. Boltke especially, through his training of his Air Force group and his work on air combat theory, would be the template of the greatest German aces of the last two years of the war. From the men under his command would rise his greatest pupil, Manfred von Richthofen, a man you may know by his nickname, the Red Baron but his is a story for another day. For the French, the summer of 1916 was a tale of two different situations. For their fighters, the summer of 1916 was a fantastic time, as their new poor 17s outclassed anything that the Germans could throw against them, and this was true even though the airplane did not use the synchronizing gear, and was instead using the older system of Lewis guns mounted on top of the wing. In August, the SPAD-7 would make its debut at the front, and this would be one of the first aircraft to use the hispano Souza engines and be armed with Vickers machine guns that could fire through the propeller. There would be a lot of issues with the SPAD, which meant that widespread availability would not happen until early 1917, but it was definitely extremely capable. It was fortunate that the French had good aircraft ready to go for 1917, because their new ports were outclassed by the Albatrosses when they started to arrive in large numbers. 
The other side of the coin was their bombers and observation planes. For these roles, the French were still using the old Voisin and Farmans, which they had been using since, like, early 1915. And the pace of evolution meant that these airframes were positively ancient by mid-1916. They were able to mitigate the problem a little bit by switching all of their bombers to go at night instead of during the day. This greatly reduced their bombing accuracy, but saved planes and pilots. However, while this changeover to night operations helped the bombers, it was not a strategy that could be used by observation planes. These slow and lumbering aircraft were easy prey for German fighters if they were not heavily protected. This would be a a problem for the entirety of 1916, all the way until the end of the year, because these outdated aircraft would still be present and arriving at the front to replace losses. This put a big damper for the French war effort, because while the fighters got all the glory and the bombers could hide in the night, the observation flights were crucial to the success of the infantry. They were the ones spotting for artillery, cataloging enemy positions, and finding the enemy guns. Each plane would have an observer, but also an artillery officer, which meant that in observation units there were just as many artillery officers as there were pilots, which I just find to be an interesting statistic. These observation flights were further handicapped because the French High Command considered protection of observation flights to be a secondary objective for fighters, who were instead tasked with actively hunting for Germans. It was hoped that by hunting down the German fighters, the observation planes would be free of trouble. This separation of concerns was exacerbated by who controlled the two groups of planes. Fighters were controlled at an army group level, while the observation planes were at an army level. This separation made coordination difficult and resulted in a lot of unprotected flights of observation planes over German lines, which rarely ended well. Much like the Germans, the French would try to protect their fighters and increase the efficiency of their fighters by grouping them together. This practice began during the actions at Verdun, but would continue all along the front during the year. There was one big difference from what the French and the Germans were doing, though, as they were grouping their planes together. The Germans mostly spread out their best pilots, putting them with less experienced pilots to help them improve. The French did the opposite, grouping their best pilots into the same squadrons. This made these squadrons extremely capable, but it reduced the average effectiveness of squadrons along the front. The French were also less effective at getting their best pilots to fly in these formations. You will still see French pilots fighting in the same lone hunter style that they had been since the beginning of the war, all the way into 1917. Behind the front, the government in Paris was struggling to optimize the French aviation industry. In an almost mere image of the German issues, the French government was trying to organize an industry that was doing everything possible to resist central control. This began to slowly change when a man named Henri Jacques Regnier was brought in to lead the effort. Regnier was an uh, artilleryman by trade, and the first thing he did was create two new departments. One department was in charge of evaluating the planes at the front and then presenting those findings to the government. The other was in charge of organizing the procurement of new airframes in a more rational manner than what had been done before. While in some ways these organizational changes would begin to pay off quickly, with really good planes like the SPAD-7 beginning to appear by the end of the year, it was not a total success. Almost immediately it became obvious that the French desperately needed a new bomber and observation plane. However, it was difficult to find manufacturers who wanted to try and produce them, with most opting to focus more on fighter production and development. The smaller and more glamorous fighters had a higher rate of return from the manufacturers, and they were considered cutting edge, which would mean more money in the future. Some of these problems and successes would set the French up for 1917, a topic for the later episode. Much like every other part of their armies, the greatest test of the German and French air forces in 1916 would be at Verdun. It would be here that the emphasis on fighters would reach new heights. The Germans had an initial advantage as they concentrated many of their planes to support the attack. These would be used to carry out strong fighting patrols, which tried to sweep the French from the air, which they were mostly successful at. This then allowed their bombers to freely drop thousands of pounds of bombs on objectives behind the front, and prevented the French from getting good intelligence about the German buildup before the attack. Much like on the ground, the French would respond to the German actions in the air with changes of their own. This came in the form of 15 elite squadrons, which were dispatched to the Verdun front in early summer. These squadrons were then controlled at the highest level, and were used strictly for specific operations designed to reduce the German advantage in the air. They would be organized in flights of four or five planes, 
although some would be smaller and some would be bigger. And these would be facing German patrols that were typically three to five in number, which often gave the French the advantage. This advantage would swing back into the German favor later, when they brought their Jagdstaffel down to the Verdun front, and they brought aces like Boltke with them, and he would increase his popularity while fighting over Verdun. Now, while Verdun would set new milestones in terms of contributions from the air, uh, it would soon be eclipsed by the attacks of the Somme. However, its role in cementing the importance of larger and larger groups of aircraft working together was important in the overall story of the war. When 1916 started, the British were perhaps in the worst spot in terms of airplanes on the Western Front. In 1915, they had taken a different approach to not having a synchronizing gear by building pusher aircraft. In a pusher aircraft, the engine is mounted on the rear of the airplane, with the propeller pushing instead of pulling the plane through the air. While this did allow a machine gun to be fitted to the front to fire forward, the performance of the pusher aircraft would never keep up with similar aircraft with propellers in the front, called a tractor aircraft. There were several examples of the pusher planes in use during 1916, with the de Havilland DH-2 and the Vickers FB-5 being the most well-known. As the year progressed, these two planes became a greater and greater liability, now, there were new types of planes arriving at the front, most in a biplane configuration, with their Lewis guns mounted on the top wing. Now, this allowed them to fire forward, but also meant that it was difficult to reload the guns, which was very important, because the Lewis guns had quite limited drum magazines. To help with this problem, the British created the Foster Wing Mount. This was a setup that allowed the pilot to pull his Lewis gun back and down towards him on a set of curved rails. This made it much easier to change drums and do fixed jams, especially since the only alternative, and they did this for a little while, was to stand up in the cockpit and reach up to manipulate the gun while in flight. While the Foster mount helped the Lewis gun system, it would always be inferior, and it would become a larger problem as the year progressed. This was of course due to better German planes arriving, but also because of the altitudes in which the majority of operations were happening kept going up. By increasing the altitude, the pilots were putting themselves and their machines in colder and colder temperatures. For the guns, this presented some problems because the grease and oil that allowed the mechanisms of the gun to operate would begin to freeze at certain temperatures, and the only way to fix this was to fire a few rounds through the gun occasionally, which meant that they had to be reloaded more often and reduce the available and already very limited ammunition in the gun at any given moment. These problems would not be solved by the British until most of the way through the year, when the Sopwith 1.5 Strutter made its appearance in the fall, but it would not arrive in great numbers until 1917. A discussion of the Royal Flying Corps from 1916 until the end of the war cannot be done without a discussion about their commander, Brigadier General Hugh Trenchard. Trenchard first came onto the scene as a lieutenant colonel who worked with Haig during the Battle of New Chapelle in early 1915. He was later named commander of the RFC in August 1915. The entire driving force behind the next three years of RFC tactics was the fact that Trenchard believed that the RFC existed solely to do what the army needed it to do, and no matter how many losses it suffered, how many planes were shot down, how many pilots did not return, as long as they were doing their best to do what the army needed, they were doing the right thing. This belief was then combined with Trenchard's obsession with pushing the RFC out over the German lines and as deep behind them as possible to cause a lot of casualties. Once they had penetrated deep behind the lines, the British pilots were then told to seek out combat no matter what the odds were. This did mean that the German planes were often unable to get to the front, and it provided their observation aircraft some breathing space over the front lines, but it did come at a great cost in British pilots. Even the lucky pilots who were not killed outright would be taken prisoner if something happened to their plane. This was one advantage that the Germans would have over the British for most of the war. If a British plane broke down, even if the plane got to the ground safely, the pilot would be taken prisoner. If a German plane broke down over their territory, the pilot could be back in the air the next day. With overall losses being so high, the ability of the British to train new pilots was crucial. In March for Death, the first war in the air... James Hamilton Patterson would describe the RFC's training regimen as having three phases during the war. The first phase was general indifference, as planes in the military were new and nobody knew what they were doing. The second phase was appallingly horrible, 
before the third phase, during 1917 and 1918, in which they managed to make it up to adequate. Since we are discussing 1916, we are squarely in that appalling phase. To showcase how bad the German training situation was, let's compare it to the French and German methods. In the French Air Force, a pilot would go through a lengthy series of trainings to learn not just how to fly the plane, but also a lot of theories and concepts around air combat. They would then learn how the planes worked, how maintenance was done on them, how best to handle wind and weather. They were then also taught how to properly navigate and how to deal with the unique torque of the modern rotary engine, which was in use in many planes at the time. On the German side, they would send their pilots off to six months of training before they were even assigned to a squadron, at which point they would get even more training before seeing combat. For the British, well, it was a a lot less. Some of the pilots would get about 1.5 hours of flying time in a two-seat trainer. Generally, these trainers were very old, very rickety, and mostly just rated for level flight. Then they would be sent up by themselves for a few hours in similarly old airframes that would not be able to do much more than a gentle dive or a slow turn. Then they were sent to the front, barely knowing how to fly, let alone how to fight. While this system may have been workable early in the war, when combat was infrequent, by 1916 it was pure homicide. The commanders at the front didn't have a choice and had to send up those that they had been given. These sometimes very green pilots would fight in the largest aerial battle in history in the summer of 1916 at a little place called the Somme. The story of the British, German, and French airmen on the Somme is a topic that I have decided to devote an entire episode to, and it just so happens to be our next one. I hope you will join me for that episode, and thank you for listening, and I hope you have a fantastic day.